Welcome back to another episode of Space This Week, a week that needs no real introduction I'm sure, but I guess I'm going to go ahead and attempt one anyway. Starship Flight 6 took place, and while it sadly lacked a super heavy recovery, we did at least get an amazing daytime view of Starship's splashdown. And that wasn't all, we also bore witness to a staggering 5 Falcon 9 launches, Rocket Lab's third of 5 dedicated Internet of Things launches for Kinez, a Russian ISS resupply launch, new depictions of how SpaceX's Starship HLS vehicle will play a role in NASA's Artemis program, and full stacking operations for Artemis 2's rocket began, with the delivery of the left aft assembly for the SLS solid rocket booster to the VAB, Blue Origin's new Glenn went vertical at the launch pad ready for hot fire, while their new Shepard rocket performed their ninth crewed mission, and much much more. Enjoy. <laughs> The biggest event of the week was the aforementioned sixth flight test of Starship, which launched from Boca Chica last Tuesday. The objectives for this launch were broadly similar to Flight 5, wherein we hoped to see a super heavy tower catch and successful splashdown of the ship in the Indian Ocean, though this time during the day, as the launch was scheduled to take off later than normal from Texas. The launch went off in the familiar, spectacular manner that Starship launches are known for at this stage, easily clearing the tower and making it all the way through Max-Q without issue, and then, when the time came, we also saw a successful hot stage of the Starship vehicle. Then it was boost back burn time, and we all waited with bated breath for the call out that all systems were go for catch number two. Of course, as you probably know by now, that call out never came. The automated systems determined that things weren't 100% nominal for catch, and so it was aborted, with the booster instead ending its flight with soft splashdown in the Gulf of Mexico. It was later shared that the abort was due to a loss of communication to the launch tower computer and that the catch would have probably still worked, but SpaceX wanted to err on the side of caution, which is understandable. They'd rather just discard a test vehicle that's never going to fly again anyway, rather than risk the critical ground infrastructure of stage zero if the catch doesn't work. After launch, it became apparent that some damage had occurred to the launch tower's lightning rod and comms tower, you know, it's a bit bent and all that, <laughs> which offers a possible explanation for the loss of comms. Although the splashdown of Booster 13 was initially rather fiery, Everyday Astronaut's live stream seemed to show the booster holding up relatively well out at sea, but it would need to be sunk. And now I'm gonna share some leaked footage. I never like being the source of leaks, but this has made the rounds all over social media and it hit the front page of Reddit, so I feel like it's out there now and out there to stay, so not a lot of harm showcasing at this point. We can see a view from an apparent support vessel of the ship's aft section, with the engine bells visible in the water. We then have the following shot of the vehicle during what we can assume to be intentional sinking, and it's really crazy to see how flimsy this thing becomes when it's not pressurised with fuel. Rest in pieces, Booster 13. So how'd the ship get on? Well, for starters, we got a view inside the payload bay while in space, where it was revealed that this thing was in fact carrying payload. Yep, for the first time, Starship didn't launch empty but it may as well have. It was only carrying a single stuffed banana, which is a little shy of its super heavy capacity, but small steps. The vehicle also successfully reignited one of its Raptor engines in space to demonstrate Starship's deorbit capability, and in doing so, it became the first vehicle ever to ignite a Raptor engine in the vacuum of space, but it still never made a stable orbit. This mission was once again technically a suborbital mission with a maximum perigee of 50 kilometers, and we soon saw re-entry begin. The re-entry profile was steeper for this flight compared to the previous ones to really put the aerodynamic control flaps through their paces. The heat shield was also missing quite a few tiles, partly because SpaceX eventually plans to catch the ship with the launch tower arms, and so some of the heat shield will need to be removed for this to make way for catch point hardware. Re-entry was by and large without anomaly, and roughly 20 minutes after re-entry, the vehicle successfully relit its sea level Raptor engines and made splashdown in the Indian Ocean, marking the first time Starship has landed from space during daylight hours. This landing also marked the final launch and landing of Starship Block 1, as the next vehicle in line to fly is of course Ship 33, which is the first Starship Block 2 vehicle. It's expected to launch atop Booster 14 in early 2025, and FAA filings suggest that SpaceX plans to fly an aircraft in the vicinity of Ship Splashdown to capture imagery of its re-entry over the ocean. 
So far, SpaceX are targeting the 11th of January for the launch date, though this is by no means a guaranteed launch date at this stage. So far, both Ship 33 and Booster 14 have undergone cryogenic testing, taking place in October this year. In the aftermath of the launch, aside from the wonky comms tower, it looks like all the ground infrastructure held up pretty well. In the days that followed, we saw crews inspecting the booster quick disconnect and the launch ring itself, and Boca Chica Gal spotted workers on the chopsticks too. Inspections appear to be significant once again. The deluge plate was tarped over, the dance floor pad was raised to allow better access to the inside of the launch mount, and scaffolding has now gone up on the launch mount as well. In other news, everyone's least favourite vehicle, and I say this because nobody likes this stupid thing, stop trying to make it have a cult following, Ship 26 was finally allowed to cease existence after being moved into the high bay and begin undergoing the chop. We were always kind of curious why SpaceX built those flapless and shieldless vehicles. They were probably built in anticipation for Super Heavy being ready to fly a lot sooner and more frequently, and before Starlink V2 was shrunk down to Falcon 9 size and was reliant on Starship being operational. And by the time Super Heavy was ready to fly regularly, normal ship production had caught up, rendering these placeholder upper stages obsolete. And of course, Starlink V2 has been miniaturized and is launched by Falcon 9 these days. But that's just a theory, who knows? What do you think? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Speaking of Starlink though, we had a massive four launches over the past seven days, growing the constellation by a total of 87 satellites. They took place last Monday, Thursday, Sunday, and then again earlier today. They all go pretty much the same, so I'll cover them as a group. Two launched from Vandenberg and two launched from Kennedy Pad 40. All four Falcon 9 first stage boosters made successful drone ship landings following stage separation, utilizing all three of SpaceX's ships, and the most notable launch was probably Thursday's, as this marked the 400th ever Falcon 9 launch. Though yesterday's was also pretty big, as this was the 100th Falcon 9 launch from Vandenberg. Falcon 9 wasn't just launching Starlink though, we also saw it launch the Indian communication satellite GSAT-20 to geosynchronous orbit last Monday. This was initially supposed to launch on an Indian LVM-3 rocket, but it was changed to Falcon 9 likely due to weight issues, as the LVM-3 has a geostationary payload capacity of 4 metric tons, while the GSAT-20 weighs 4.7 metric tons. Too heavy for LVM-3, but within the capabilities of Falcon 9 and this mission marked the first Indian communications satellite to launch on an American rocket in over 30 years. Following stage separation, the Falcon 9 first stage landed on the Just Read the Instructions drone ship in the Atlantic Ocean, completing its 19th mission. In the very early hours of today, over at New Zealand's Mahia Peninsula, Rocket Lab launched an electron rocket with five Kinez nanosatellites on board, on mission Ice AIS Baby, <laughs> the third of five dedicated launches for Kinez's Internet of Things satellite constellation, and all went well. The satellites are now all operational, and Rocket Lab's next launch for Kinez is currently expected sometime next month, and the fifth and final early next year. China was launching stuff last week too. Yesterday, a Long March 2C launched Superview Neo 2, 3, and 4 to low Earth orbit. Official sources have described the satellites as two high-resolution radar satellites that will mainly serve fields such as natural resources, urban safety, emergency management, and maritime affair, providing users with rich data products and diverse application services. Hmm. Last week saw another resupply mission to the International Space Station. The uncrewed Roscosmos Progress 90 cargo spacecraft launched from the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan last Thursday atop a Soyuz rocket. The spacecraft was filled with nearly three tons of supplies and cargo and marked the 182nd launch of a Progress spacecraft. Docking to the Poisk module took place on Saturday, delivering food, fuel, and supplies for the Expedition 72 crew aboard the station. We have a booster segment on the mobile launcher for Artemis 2's SLS. This was following the transportation of the first SRB aft skirt to the vehicle assembly building last Monday, and upon arrival, stacking operations began. Engineers and technicians with NASA's Exploration Ground Systems program began stacking the Artemis 2 moon rocket by placing the first segment of the left SRB aft assembly onto Mobile Launcher 1. This milestone took place inside the Vehicle Assembly Building at Kennedy Space Center last Wednesday and marked the first of 10 booster sections that will comprise the assembly of the Artemis II rocket. The two solid rocket boosters provide over 75% of the total SLS thrust when it lifts off from Launchpad 39B. The core stage remains horizontal to be stacked at a later point in time. 
Artemis 2 will, of course, be a test flight which will see humans travel back to the moon for the first time since Apollo 17. But it'll just be a flyby, no landing will happen. Landing will take place on a later mission and will be facilitated by SpaceX's Starship Human Landing System. And while this vehicle doesn't exist yet, NASA and SpaceX have shared some new renders of how this vehicle may end up looking. First, we have this artist concept of the HLS en route to the moon during an orbital refuel with a tanker. Once propellant loading operations in Earth orbit are completed, SpaceX will then send the fully fueled Starship HLS to the moon, where it will then dock directly to Orion so that two astronauts can transfer from the spacecraft to the lander to descend to the moon's surface, while two others remain aboard Orion. Artemis 4 will then see the addition of the Lunar Gateway Station, which will serve as the crew transfer location. I gotta say, this render of Orion docked to HLS looks kinda funny. Really looks like the handover moment between the past and the future. It'll be crazy to see in real life. I've also seen some people wondering how this will work, considering that there's a header tank here, right? Well, no. The header tanks are in the regular starships for the flip and landing burn, which isn't something required by the HLS, so no header tank here. SpaceX and NASA shared new renders of how the two astronauts will descend down to the lunar surface. Yep, the plan is to still use an elevator to lower them down to the ground. I particularly like contrasting this render to this one, shared by SpaceX, showing how HLS will potentially evolve to have, well, more windows at the very least, and I'm sure a host of other upgrades as well. Wait a second. SN42? That means we're less than 11 Starship launches away! I mean, not seriously, of course, unless the HLS vehicles start from SN1 again. Speaking of human spaceflight, Blue Origin launched their NS-28 mission last Friday, marking their ninth crewed mission to suborbital space, with the capsule reaching an apogee of 107 kilometers. The crew roster for this flight were all tourists, and they were Emily Calandrelli, science communicator and host of Emily's Wonder Lab, as well as Mark and Sharon Hagel on their second New Shepard flight, following their trip aboard NS-20, Austin Littoral, who won his seat through a giveaway, as well as James Russell and the lone Canadian among USA citizens Henry Wolfund. The flight was entirely successful, with the crew capsule making safe touchdown at Blue Origin's West Texas landing site and successful vertical landing of the booster. Hopefully Blue Origin are just as successful with the landing of their much more impressive New Glenn first stage booster, which is orbital class rather than suborbital. The first fully integrated New Glenn ever, which weighs in at roughly 726 metric tons, or over 425 Ford F-150 pickup trucks for any Americans watching, is now vertical. The hard date for the maiden launch of New Glenn, Mission Blue Ring, is yet to be confirmed, aside from a loose no earlier than December schedule. It's called Blue Ring because it'll carry just that. Blue Ring is a spacecraft platform designed to be capable of refueling, transporting and hosting satellites, and it itself is capable of on-orbit refueling when operational. But the most exciting part of the maiden flight of New Glenn will of course be the attempted recovery of the first stage, marking the first time, finally, that another company actually lands a first stage SpaceX style. We are in some fierce need of competition in the commercial space launch sector, and I really hope Blue Origin can finally deliver. Laon Aerospace was back in action on Saturday. I thought it might be nice to take a little trip down memory lane, marvel at how far Kerbal Space Program has come thus far by flying the hideous looking original Mark III parts and attempting to make a janky space shuttle out of them. I had a lot of fun on this nostalgic little trip, so if it sounds like a good time, then it should now be one of the clickable cards on screen. There's also another video from my channel there, as well as the names of all my Patreon and channel supporters. If you want to support Space this week, then do consider signing up. I always do appreciate it. But other than that, thank you so much for watching, and I'll catch you in the next one.